we are going to start with uh, EMS Medicine Live. Um, so this is our uh, September um, conference. Sorry about August. Um, the end of school um, rush and end of summer holidays kind of crushed us and we didn't have time to get one put together and none of us were available to host one. So we just kind of uh, called it off and uh, came back in September with the next quarter uh, scheduled out. Um, so we're doing September now. This is what upstate New York looks like. Uh, it'll be covered in snow in about two weeks. Uh, but for the time being, we're all enjoying um, apple picking and uh, the good weather we have here in New York. So obviously EMS Medicine Live, uh, our goal is to create content uh, for the average EMS physician and for EMS fellows across the country, uh, either as information sharing um, or as board preparation. Uh, we've done both in the past few months. Um, this is also a way to see EMS physicians from across the, uh, the country uh, who's been taking part in this. And uh, over time, I'd like to get you all involved to get your experiences, your lessons learned, and your uh, skills involved in this conference. I do want to share uh, real quick some results uh, of a survey we sent out uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we sent out a conference to all fellowship directors uh, across the country and asked just a few questions. Uh, just less than half have seen EM, uh, EML in the past 10 months or so. Um, majority who have not seen it have schedule conflicts, which is not too surprising. Uh, we can't make our schedule fit for everyone. Uh, there were two, one forgot and one wasn't aware. Um, I'm not sure how that happened, but we'll find that person and make them aware. Uh, we do have uh, 10 new fellowships who want to be a part of this. Uh, we've They've self-identified themselves, and we'll try to get them involved soon for, for teaching and uh, being involved. Uh, we did ask what kind of content they wanted or what kind of content the directors thought we should be putting on. And the overall lesson is they're looking for less common uh, topics or topics that other uh, fellowship sites can't teach. Uh, tactical, air medical, international, wilderness, uh, mobile integrated healthcare. Uh, and maybe some hot topics like we're doing next month, uh, things that are pertinent, pertinent to uh, EMS physicians and uh, are new in the literature or uh, new across the country. And the last question we asked was the time. Um, we had a wide range of time responses when we should be having this conference. Uh, the overwhelming majority was Tuesdays at 1, Tuesdays at 4, and Mondays at 1. I think the afternoons are popular for the West Coast uh, Central Time Zones. Um, and then Monday, Tuesday, and even Thursday at four, which was surprising, came up. Uh, I know for uh, myself and Derek, we can't do Thursday at four, so we'll look at these other times and see what works out. Uh, for the programs who did say they want to be participating in this, I think I'll reach out to them, and we'll find a time amongst ourselves. We might just keep the Tuesdays at one, but we'll try to find a better time if one exists. If you have a time you prefer, go ahead and email us um, or me directly. All right, so getting back to Zoom. Um, so as usual, uh, Zoom conference, everyone's gonna be muted. Um, there's just too much background noise otherwise. Uh, if you do have questions, um, actually I don't have my laptop with me. Uh, you can uh, message Seth Dukes, he's my fellow, or Derek Cooney, he's gonna be here for about half an hour or half of this roughly. Um, or you can raise your hand virtually, and we'll look for that. Uh, since my computer screen is going to be controlled by Jeremy, I can't respond directly. Um, we are going to ask people not to record uh, this session. Um, there is some uh, patient information and some content we don't want distributed across um, to everyone. After we finish this conference, um, we'll edit some things out. And with Jeremy's permission, we'll, we'll post that online. So we may cut a couple of things out, but the vast majority of the content will still be available. And questions at the end, unmute yourself at the end and uh, ask whatever you have, or just message us and we'll, we'll try to do it at the end as well. Uh, so today we're lucky we have uh, Jeremy Cushman from the University of Rochester. Um, I was fortunate enough to see his uh, brief talk on this topic, got three years ago, I think, somewhere around then at ASP. Um, and he has now a longer one hour, or close to one hour um, session on this. Um, and it's a good topic. I really think 
most EMS physicians and EM folks who go in the field should watch. There's lots of lessons learned, and it's a good topic for, for all of us to watch. So with that, I'm going to try to hand I'm going to mute myself, Jeremy, and hand it over to you, I think. All right. Thank you, Christian. Let me just uh, my... Thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Again, this, uh, uh, I, I learned a lot in this uh, relatively unique incident, and uh, as much as I can, I can try to share, um, I, will, I will do so. So I certainly value questions um, and, uh, and comments uh, towards, towards the end of this. Um, uh, the, the disclaimer is that I, uh, Christian has been kind enough to, uh, to edit a few things on here because there are, are a few things that are patient specific things, including a video that you'll see, um, that out of, uh, deference for the family and an ongoing, uh, civil litigation that I, I can't have out in, uh, uh, in the wilderness of, uh, of ethernet. Um, the, the unique thing about this event is, uh, as I was telling Christian before we started, um, uh, Law enforcement. Uh, this whole event took place over about four, four, four and a half hours, and uh, there were uh, both law enforcement and uh, and fire department photographers uh, at this whole thing. So there's about 800 uh, photos of this entire event um, that allow for a great pictorial um, representation of of what happened. So if I can figure out, all right. Aha, now we're moving. All right, so here's the deal. Uh, it was, I believe it was a Wednesday. This is now uh, four years ago, uh, about 14, 36 hours. Uh, uh, the Rochester Fire Department was dispatched for a uh, crane toppled over with a person trapped, possible injuries. Uh, six minutes later, uh, companies were calling out on scene. Took a few more minutes for everybody to, to uh, uh, determine the uh, the scope, um, and then uh, about fourteen fifty six hours, um, the uh, the deputy chief uh, had requested uh, myself to the scene. Uh, like many of you, um, we have uh, uh, field response capabilities uh, that we do, and I was fortunately just wrapping up in, in ED shift, so I skedaddled out of there uh, quite quite quickly. Christian, this is not moving. Oh, well, maybe it is. There we go. Uh, so where where are we? Well, um, uh, the Genesee River goes through the center of Rochester, uh, flows north into uh, Lake Ontario, and uh, in the center of the screen uh, is one of uh, three falls. Uh, this is uh, what's called Middle Falls. Uh, not surprisingly, there's an upper and a lower falls. Um, and uh, they were doing some construction on this spillway as part of... Uh, uh, an enhancement program. Uh, the street to the lower right corner is Brewer Street, which is uh, how the incident uh, really, really got its uh, got its name. Uh, initial companies arrived uh, to see this. Uh, this is obviously a crane that should not be uh, upside down, partially in the river. Um, and really, what this crane was doing is, is uh, in the center of your screen, you see these. Um, uh, triangular um, uh, concrete abutments and what it was doing is it was leapfrogging these concrete abutments to move the crane from uh, the north side uh, to the south side uh, to be able to do some additional construction and then something obviously went uh, terribly awry uh, and that this is again uh, another picture of uh, of the crane and it's uh, rather precarious uh, position at the time um, the, so you wonder how this happens. Uh, this is the video surveillance, um, of, uh, of the crane as it was leapfrogging. Um, obviously, uh, there was an issue. Uh, so our victim was, uh, operating that, um, and was, uh, essentially partially ejected. Now we didn't even know that this video existed until about three, four hours into the incident. Not that it would have changed any of our, of our impacts. Um, but it's a 30 ton crane and uh, it flipped over. Um, the flow of the Genesee River, I'm gonna go back up here a second. This is the last of the technical glitches, I promise, folks. Oh. Um, so, uh, so this is really how we, how we see uh, the crane pretty initially um, with, uh, with our initial responders who arrived to find a conscious and oriented victim um, who uh, you can see part of his legs uh, in the center of the screen, in the center, um, right underneath uh, the the crane uh, itself. 
Um, so he was conscious, he was oriented, he was able to, to answer questions, but he was uh, pinned um, underneath uh, this, uh, this, this crane. So certainly it was a, a somewhat unique uh, environment. We talk about working in a, in a fishbowl in the emergency department and everybody watching. Well, this is really the ultimate fishbowl uh, because uh, the scene, the, the crane is actually behind you uh, from where the picture is taken. Uh, and then all of the co-workers um, are up uh, along the ridge of the dam. That big door right there is holding the Genesee River back, um, which is always a, a, little, a little disconcerting. So we had a few different challenges here. Um, we had a movable gate uh, that obviously is part of the spillway. The Genesee River can be uh, modified in terms of flow by, uh, by Rochester Gas and Electric. And so they could uh, very quickly shut down, uh, if you will, the, the flow down the river. But of course, it had rained a whole bunch the previous couple of days. So we only had theoretically about three hours of time that they could hold the, uh, the water flow back uh, until we had, uh, we had spillage um, that, would, uh, um, that would create some hazards. Uh, again, this is just more situational awareness, but um, it, puts a, it puts a certain time limitation because one of the advantages of working in, in the Genesee River uh, Gorge is, is that we can uh, drop the flow rate tremendously, which adds a significant margin of, of safety. Uh, the other challenge that we had was uh, that it's, uh, it's slippery. Uh, it was at a slope. Uh, the crane was at a slope. And one of the reasons that this uh, incident took as long as it did is that it's pretty hard to stabilize a 30-ton crane that's essentially pivoting on the boom. Uh, and the fact that we were already working at a 30 to 40 degree slope uh, became, uh, became somewhat, somewhat hazardous. Uh, lastly, we, we did have an unstable crane. Um, our initial attempts to extricate the individual um, included some, some basic lifting techniques, um, and unfortunately, the crane moved about six inches towards the river, uh, which caused all efforts to stop until we could identify a way in which uh, to secure the crane from moving uh, further towards the river and potentially uh, taking our victim. It also obviously um, points out that there's only one way to access uh, the victim, uh, that nobody in their right mind is going to access them from the riverside. You had to access them uh, from uh, the dam side of the uh, uh, of the incident. So patient access issues became, became important. Um, as we all know, uh, incidents like this bring out uh, everybody. Uh, on the fire side, um, more than half of the Rochester Fire Department, so that's about, uh, we had about 80 um, uh, fire uh, personnel from the Rochester Fire Department that were there. Uh, we had two of the surrounding uh, county agencies that were brought in because of some of their uh, heavy extrication equipment, um, specifically the use of uh, some grip hoists uh, in the County Fire Bureau. Uh, from an EMS presence, we had uh, our contract ambulance service in the city, which is Royal Metro, myself, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, this is a fatal incident uh, eventually, and so the ME's office was involved. Uh, law enforcement, construction workers, uh, media, civilians, so there were a boatload of people, and one thing that was done extraordinarily poorly with this is that we have actually no idea in terms of accountability how many people um, were at this, at this incident. Um, that was clearly one of the, the flaws of, of incident management um, at, this, at this incident. And, and you'll understand why that might be important um, here, here in a bit. So from a, from a fellow uh, perspective, and really for all of us as EMS physicians, we, we really have to remember that um, we really need to make sure that we participate in the accountability process. Uh, and so whether you have uh, accountability tags or other measures, uh, make sure that you are part of that and that it's happening. Um, I certainly find myself reminding uh, command officers on a unfortunately somewhat regular basis uh, who's who's taking accountability and how do I make sure that um, uh, my my wife can find my remains later on that, that I really was at this incident. Um, the the other thing that I think we all notice as EMS physicians is that um, we all very often also play the role of a safety officer. Uh, maybe not specifically regarding the fire attack um, or the extrication, but really um, thinking about the, the medical needs uh, and the medical risks um, to the rest of the responding crew. Um, and in this case, yes, there was a safety officer, uh, but really nobody was ever thinking about uh, the risks to 
um, the rest of the responders. Um, and even I didn't do a very good job at that because I was focused on the victim, uh, which gets to one of our teaching points a little bit later on that, that, that I'll share as well. And when in reality, this is the perfect scene to control access. This is the only way uh, to get um, in and out of the accident scene was through this, uh, through this man ladder. So you had a perfect setup to control access. Um, however, we, we didn't. Um, the other challenge that we had is uh, from that parking area that you remember on the initial map that it was, uh, it was quite a ways. Uh, it was about a hundred yards from uh, the uh, parking area, uh, almost a quarter of a mile from where all of the apparatus was uh, staging during this incident. And so uh, that, that became a, a challenge uh, in terms of moving stuff. Um, in this incident, we had uh, a number of companies that were detailed just to move uh, cribbing and, and heavy rescue equipment and therefore exerting themselves um, during this time. Uh, we had a single uh, a, a truck company whose sole responsibility was to be the elevator uh, and to bring things up and down uh, in terms of all of the equipment uh, that we needed. Um, this also plays into our understanding as to how long is it going to take to get this patient from definitive care once we get him out uh, from underneath this crane. Uh, and so uh, a very safe estimate was it would probably take us about 15 uh, to 20 minutes from the time that he was extricated from uh, the crane to being in the back of the ambulance and moving down the road given, given the incident site um, and the hazards that we have there. And that becomes really important when we get into rescue and recovery determinations um, a, little bit, a little bit later on. You know, the other thing that I, I did not do very well with this is that um, I don't have a fellow, I, I don't have a huge cadre of docs, um, uh, and I didn't bring any reinforcements. And this was a really long incident. And as I mentioned, there were certain clearly needs uh, for uh, the victim, but there were also needs for the responders. And, and bringing reinforcements, meaning other docs, is really, really important um, that nobody should really go to an incident this big um, alone because I certainly got tunnel vision in this. Um, and it's important that you have other folks that, that can do it. The other hazard is that uh, there's only about three of us that operate our response vehicle. And we're the only ones that know where the stuff is in the vehicle. And so what we've done uh, since then, and again, this is four or five years ago, is number one, making sure that we clearly label all of our bags and what the, what the purpose of those bags are. You know, for example, the ALS bag, the airway bag, uh, the crush bag, uh, the tox bag, et cetera. Uh, and then what I've also done is I've made sure that we've familiarized, uh, you know, some of our, our key personnel in the different departments um, so that they know what's in the vehicle. Uh, and therefore how to access it. Because once I made patient contact, I wasn't really in a, in excited about leaving the patient um, to trek up in another quarter mile to get more gear out of my truck. Instead, I can have, um, for example, our uh, one of our uh, EMS supervisors be able to get the equipment uh, out of the vehicle uh, or one of our EMS officers from the fire department be able to do the same. So um, again, familiarize some key personnel with, with your vehicle, what's in it, uh, where it is, uh, so that they can get it for you if you are actually you know, well uh, knee deep into, a, uh, into an incident. And then scene control is, is huge because, as I mentioned before, this is, this is a relatively high-risk uh, environment, and you look at what utter chaos this is, right? So this is relatively early on in, in the incident. You see our victim uh, down here, uh, who, again, is, is conscious and, and talking. We have a couple of firemen uh, attending to him. We have a guy leaning over the edge over here that doesn't have a PFD on. You got uh, all sorts of Right, lots of lots of people, very very uncontrolled, uh, uncontrolled scene, um, and it took a while, um, but eventually we were able to control that scene. And once, um, and unfortunately, this was literally probably an hour and a half into it, um, really identify who does and who does not need to be in these environments, because we all know how chaotic it gets in our emergency departments when a, when a trauma or a cardiac arrest comes in and everybody and their mother wants to be in there. Um, and it's very difficult to control the environment and, and provide good care. Same thing is the case here. And so everybody in this picture had a very, very clearly defined uh, task. Um, and so as we kind of zoom up in here,
here, you know, these, these three individuals uh, in, in the, with the green circles were really our, our command staff. Uh, the gentleman in the task force two shirt was our, our technical rescue uh, expert uh, slash consultant uh, the uh, the battalion chief here in the white uh, was really the operations um, uh, supervisor. Uh, this gentleman, uh, this is uh, one of the lieutenants uh, who is responsible for uh, extrication. Um, these four uh, gentlemen uh, were all responsible for uh, actually facilitating uh, the extrication using uh, hydraulic tools uh, and so forth. Uh, this was the medical team, so myself, uh, one of the Royal Metro uh, supervisors and one of the uh, Rochester firemen who uh, essentially became um, my, my monitor and vital signs the entire time. Um, these two individuals, and this is something that we often forget about, the two people with the uh, purple circles around their head, their sole responsibility was to extract the patient once we got him out. Uh, so their role was not to get bound up in um, uh, tool extrication or safety or anything else, but once the victim was pulled out of this environment, to get them on the backboard and hightail them up to uh, where the Stokes was uh, to extract them out of there. And then lastly, these two individuals, uh, uh, as you can see, we just use simple jacks on both sides of this crane uh, to help lift uh, the crane up. And, and their role was, of course, to, to keep an eye on that jack and yell really loud if something is moving in a direction that we didn't want it to. So again, scene control becomes really important. But let's go back to our patient care goals, right? So we have a, uh, a gentleman that's, that's stuck underneath a crane. First thing that we want to do, obviously, is, is assess injuries and monitor closely. Um, and I don't know about some of my colleagues that are on the, on the, on the call right now, but, but generally when I have incidents like this, I'm, I'm not terribly interested in, in monitors and life packs and all of that stuff. What I prefer is I prefer one human being um, to make and maintain contact with that victim the entire time and be able to uh, obviously get a set of vitals, but really just monitor their mental status. And in this case, uh, we had a 63-year-old uh, a male uh, with a history of uh, hypertension uh, and really no other medical problems who remembers everything that happened, um, that he was operating the crane and then it flipped. Uh, he feels like obviously he was partially ejected from it. Um, he cannot move. Um, by virtue of being entrapped, not because of, of paralysis. Um, and he is um, able to breathe and, and talk. He is having some respiratory difficulty. He's mildly tachycardic at about 105, 108 um, beats per minute. His uh, uh, manual blood pressure, we did get one uh, before his position moved such that we couldn't access him anymore. Um, and his, his blood pressure was in the 130s or so. Um, and he was a, an unbelievably cooperative patient. He was unbelievably patient uh, from, uh, in terms of time um, and uh, was trying to, trying to help us um, identify ways to be able to remove him uh, from this. So uh, quite quickly, uh, the plan was to use um, one, of our, one of our firemen uh, who had made the initial patient contact, uh, who was really going to be the eyes and ears and, and monitor him constantly. And that was his, his role uh, really for the next um, almost three and a half hours. Our other care goals, is, as I think we all know, for, for prolonged entrapments is, uh, is, is controlling temperature uh, and mitigating uh, uh, crush. We'll talk about that in a, sec in a second. And then really, how are we going to facilitate um, all of that? So this is really one of the first pictures of him right after uh, folks uh, got there. And you see a fair amount of his body is exposed. Um, on the upper right hand corner, you see some orange stuff um, that was the cab of of the crane um, and uh, his feet were pulled up underneath there, but to the extent of entrapment, we were not quite clear again he 's able to answer questions uh, he is able to uh, uh, follow commands and, and so forth. Uh, and so uh, firefighter Faulkner here is uh, um, again, maintaining contact and he was with him um, that, uh, that entire time. So he was my, my life pack 15 or my Zoll or my Phillips or whichever one you want to use today um, uh, for this, for this incident. Now the next goal, right, is, you know, thinking about, okay, how can we, how can we maintain his temperature? Now, 
right now, um, on that day, it was, uh, it was a very, very nice day. It was in the mid eighties. It was sunny. It wasn't too big an issue, but I just want to remind everybody that even really there's only one or two days in upstate New York where, um, you don't need to worry about, uh, temperature regulation. Um, because really anything that's less than 98.6 means that they're going to start losing, uh, losing their, their body to heat and, and temperature. And, and we know that that's all bad. So just as a quick reminder, there are some, uh, both intrinsic and treatment related things that we do, uh, that often worsen uh, traumatic hypothermia, right? We know that with increased age or really the extremes of age, uh, alcohol intoxication and injury severity, all of those uh, are directly uh, correlated with, uh, with decreases in body temperature. And then certainly the things that we do, uh, whether it's uh, fluid or blood product administration, treatment exposure, and, and so forth. And we also know that there's all sorts of really bad things. And I'm not going to go through all these given the audience that we have today. But I think we all know that, that traumatic hypothermia is a real thing, um, and it affects just about every organ system um, that, that we have to deal with. And so we have really this, this fundamental triad that we always have to remember in terms of hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy. And there's a handful of studies that all very clearly demonstrate um, that um, you know, hypothermia is associated with an increased mortality. And, and that definition of hypothermia is much different than what we consider environmental hypothermia, right? Most of us are thinking a, a cold exposure, it's less than 95, when in fact, uh, really anything less than 96.8 is, is considered traumatic um, hypothermia. So that becomes really important. That's something that, quite frankly, we did not do a very good job at during this incident, um, was, uh, was trying to maintain his, his body temperature. And this is just a, a picture uh, that, that kind of reminds me of the extremes. And these are men and women uh, serving us uh, in Iraq a number of years ago. Uh, and that is a, a live uh, human being um, that is in the body bag because that, for those of you that have, have done military service, thank you, but uh, that was not uncommon uh, in order to maintain uh, body temperature uh, is to place um, our are injured uh, in a body bag, put a bunch of um, um, heating devices in there uh, to maintain their, uh, their body temperature. And obviously everybody in this picture is uh, breaking a sweat. So uh, it, just, it just goes to show us how, how important this is and how our military colleagues have, uh, like many things, gotten it right. So back to our victim, right? So um, call me crazy, but I figured maybe a 30-ton crane on top of somebody might cause some crush problems. Um, and so, you know, we have to remember about crush syndrome and, and really all, all the different effects that it had. And I think we all know really our, our management for that is, is going to be fluid administration, right? Because we have um, shock, uh, all, all of our uh, metabolic things uh, that occur uh, associated with this. And we all know that uh, we really have to have a high index of suspicion in the field. Um, not Obviously, we're not getting CKs in the field, and it's kind of useless. You have to have a good clinical um, suspicion for it. And really, there's not a ton of harm in initiating therapy relatively relatively early because either you have somebody that dies right away uh, or in, in weeks um, generally. And, and the way that this uh, incident um, uh, carries out, I think you'll be able to understand um, why this patient uh, had uh, cross syndrome being associated with um, with his with his ultimate ultimate death. Um, so our medical management, again, I'm, I'm not going to go too much into because I, I think this is all bread and butter for us. Um, but just keep in mind that we need to have aggressive fluid administration. Um, my personal approach is is hydrate the the heck out of them uh, with abnormal saline before moving to uh, to bicarb, uh, which does pose some problems when you have somebody that's trapped for four hours because they're going to have to pee at some point in time. Um, so you have to think about that as, as well. Certainly, there are a lot of another, uh, other management considerations. We won't go into those uh, uh, today. Um, you know, some of us may do a little bit of a bolus of, of bicarb. Some of us may do uh, some uh, preemptive tourniquet application, all of which may have a role in certain circumstances. But uh, in this case, um, as you'll find, none of these were really, uh, really options. Because um, the first uh, period of time for this, uh, you saw the initial picture earlier, um, our victim had his arm out, uh, which was just begging for a nice big 14 gauge IV, right? Um, and about 30 minutes into the extrication um, and about, about the time that I got there uh, is when they did the first lift of the crane to see if they could, um, they could 
uh, pull him out. That's when the crane went towards the river about six inches and, and the patient screamed and everybody screamed and everybody stopped. Um, but what that did is that it, it actually did move up the crane uh, just enough so that it was more comfortable for our victim to move towards the riverside uh, and turn his shoulder in such that all of his extremities were facing towards the river. And the only thing that was facing towards us was his back and his head and his left butt. Um, and so we lost our golden opportunity to gain vascular access, which is really a hallmark um, of any type of prolonged uh, entrapment. There was physically um, no way to access uh, an extremity um, uh, or uh, even uh, the neck given his position. Uh, again, this, is, this was relatively early, the picture that you see right here, um, but you know, the, again, the, the takeaway that I continue to, to emphasize to my paramedics as well is, you know, listen, if you have somebody that is heavily entrapped, it really, as soon as you can, please just at least get a lock in them, get some form of access, um, because in this case, um, we had a golden opportunity. Uh, we lost it um, because uh, extrication kind of uh, went before uh, medical management, and then uh, the the patient uh, very volitionally wanted to move to a position that was more comfortable for him, uh, that was not ideal for us, and he couldn't get back out of that, back out of that position. So then we we start thinking about facilitated extrication. I know you guys had a had a chat about this uh, earlier this year on on uh, EMS Medicine Live, uh, so we won't again go through this too much. But um, you know, here's. Is that an option for this guy? Well, obviously, well, it could be, right? We could give him, him, him an IM injection of, of something to facilitate his extrication. Um, but he's still conscious. He's still uh, oriented to his surroundings. He's uncomfortable, but uh, he actually did not want any pain medications. I offered him a number of, of times some uh, intramuscular uh, uh, pain medications, and he, he did not want it. Um, but one of the things we have to think about with facilitated extrication is that I, I personally will never use this uh, unless I know that I'm going to be able to get them out, right? And I have, I have means to access uh, his, his head, maintain his airway, and so forth. And it was pretty clear in this case that um, I may not have that ability um, to be able to do that uh, given, his, given his positioning in the vehicle. In the, uh, underneath the crane. So um, we can remember our, our indications. We need to think about how we may use it, um, but certainly preparation for any type of facilitated extrication is absolutely critical. They need to be medically optimized. Um, obviously, I, I'd love to have cabinography and, and cardiac monitoring and, and so forth and the ability to manage their airway, but uh, in this case, um, many of those things uh, were not possible. Um, and, and therefore, obviously, we, we did not have that as an option. Uh, and lastly, uh, you know, certainly I, I can only speak for, for some of our upstate folks, but uh, maybe it's better in some other places. But making sure that the, uh, the medical and the rescue teams are, are on the same page um, is sometimes a challenge. Uh, and we need to make sure that everybody is on the same page because as, as we noticed early on in this incident, we did not have the opportunity to to get in there and, and at least get vascular access on him before they started an extrication, which then uh, caused us to lose uh, that opportunity for vascular access later on. Uh, and so that really comes back to the docs uh, uh, educating all the parties as to why that's important and why you need to let us in there uh, to be able to get that initial assessment uh, and perhaps an initial intervention uh, so that we have it uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so in terms of, again, uh, facilitated extrication, um, uh, really this is most of what I mentioned earlier in terms of analgesic sedation uh, and, and removal and, uh, and making sure that everybody uh, pays attention. That, that again, was uh, covered very, very well earlier, uh, earlier this year. So, so let's go kind of back to our, back to our patient, right? So we have this, uh, this older gentleman who's stuck underneath, uh, underneath the crane. Our initial assessment is that he certainly has the potential for significant crush injuries, as well as um, my concern for uh, pelvic and or other rib fractures. Uh, the other concern was his legs in that um, he could not uh, move his legs very well because of entrapment, not because of 
of paralysis, but we could not uh, identify very well how entangled his feet were underneath uh, the crane. Uh, we actually used uh, confined space cameras and other things to try to get a good visual, but it was very, very difficult because of how far underneath um, his feet were and how difficult it was uh, to, to access that. So it took uh, literally um, about three hours, uh, almost three hours and 20 minutes from the time of the initial incident uh, to effectively stabilize this, uh, utilizing extraordinarily heavy rigging and, and so forth, um, so that when we lifted up the, uh, the crane uh, to extract the victim, that he did not, um, and the crane did not go into the river. So throughout that entire time, we are making uh, constant reassessments with him, um, but uh, frustratingly not uh, able to gain any type of uh, vascular access um, or uh, be able to deliver really any type of treatment um, during that uh, during that time and so uh, as you remember from the in initial incident log um, it was about um, I think it was about 2.30, 2.35 in the afternoon that this uh, call happened. Um, this picture is taken um, a few minutes after, uh, after 6, um, when about 6 p.m. we were able to uh, have everything situated enough that we could elevate the, uh, the crane. And, and we did. We lifted up the crane about two inches, um, which was enough to pull uh, our patient out uh, from underneath, only to um, recognize that his feet were indeed completely encased in the cab uh, that remained of, of the crane. So our thought was that he was ejected and his feet were on the concrete with the cab above it, but in fact that was not the case. Um, his, his foot was completely, uh, completely trapped um, into that. And so um, we pulled him out, we started gaining IV access. Um, I am uh, uh, in, the, in the tan gear here. You can see part of his jeans there um, and uh, you know, I think all of us have taken care of patients over, over our careers where um, we know what's about to happen um, and that uh, god-awful pit in our stomach uh, comes out. And, uh, and this, was, uh, this was certainly the case for me because the, uh, the lieutenant called me over and said, Doc, we got a problem. And uh, sure enough, now that he was elevated enough, you could get your hands in there and realize that his entire, his entire foot and ankle um, was completely encased um, in metal, uh, in that he was not, the rest of his body was not coming out, uh, except with torches or a field amputation. So while that is happening, and, and again, that's, uh, that is kind of his, his legs, uh, caught up, uh, caught up in there. Um, the, the thought of field amputation comes into play, right? So um, again, I th I'm pretty sure you've had a, I had a chat on this as well um, in that really, right, our, our goal is to just free the limb and, and free the casualty. It's not definitive. Um, and, you know, in this case, uh, we've certainly exhausted most of our, um, our other methods uh, and our, our victim uh, at this point in time very rapidly started to decompensate. In an ideal world, our field amputation, uh, we're, we're optimizing uh, that patient uh, and we're performing that amputation as, as distal as possible. I think all of us have probably been called out to uh, amputation uh, requests only to find that their entire torso is in whatever the device. And I don't know about you guys, but hemicorpectomies are not in my, uh, uh, not in my skill set. So, um, so a lot of that is also just kind of ed uh, educating our, our providers. Um, uh, this is the, the very simplistic kit that I, I keep in, in our vehicle. Um, we, uh, we simply use a, a giggly saw uh, and, uh, and handles. Uh, we practice it on a, on a regular basis. I uh, remember applying our, our tourniquet, making uh, as close a circumferential uh, incision, uh, removing as much tissue as you, as you can, uh, applying your, uh, your giggly saw and, and simply cutting. Uh, 
um, this is one way to do it. Uh, there are also uh, other saws out there. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, there's also a Sawzall on every rescue truck, which, uh, which unfortunately is what I used in this case. Um, but uh, our, our field amputation gets, gets completed and, and gets uh, appropriately dressed and, and so forth. So, uh, so that has to go through your mind, right? So am I, am I about to do a field amputation on this guy? And literally, as that is going through my mind, um, the, uh, uh, the, the paramedic that was, uh, mitigating him is telling me, Jeremy, that, you know, he's, his color just went to crap, uh, and, uh, he's not really effectively breathing. He's unconscious now. Right. So very, very rapidly, uh, literally within about eight to nine minutes from the time that the, um, it was even less than that. It was about four and a half minutes from the time that the crane was lifted to his physical decompensation. Um, that's, that's all it took. His color became ashen. Uh, he became obtunded. And again, he was conscious the entire time. Uh, at that point in time, we had vascular access because we had pulled him out of um, his torso, at least out. And now you have a decision of, okay, do I manage the patient or do I do the, do the field amputation? Um, keep in mind that at this point in time, he is still prone. Um, so that makes airway management a little bit more challenging. Although I was able to intubate him, we got him on the monitor. He's got a wide complex uh, tachycardia, no doubt because of his hyperkalemia, um, started with some calcium and then very quickly lost pulses. And so he de decompensated extraordinarily, extraordinarily quickly. And now's, now's now is the part that none of us really like, but that I think all of us have to be prepared for as EMS physicians is, is making the call, right? So all these guys, and you can see their body, body languages, I'm telling them we're done, essentially, um, that we have to think about our, our rescue and, and recovery considerations, right? So in this case, I have somebody that I cannot even do effective CPR on. It's still going to take me on a good day uh, quite a few minutes um, to to amputate his extremity for what is likely a terminal condition anyway. Right? Not to mention that I already said that it's going to take probably a good 20 minutes to package him up, uh, get him lifted up into an ambulance, and then another 10 to 12 minutes to definitive care. So we know what the data is uh, for essentially blunt uh, traumatic arrest in the field, and we have to be prepared for that. And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about it. Um, I, I thought about managing crush. I thought about managing facilitated extrication. I thought about um, uh, doing a field amputation. I didn't think about when would I stop everything? When, when would I say, guys, we're done? Um, and I think that's one of those things that we all have to, we all have to consider because there's a tremendous amount of risk associated with this, with this evolution, right? The river is already bursting at it seems because it's been three and a half hours that we've held flow back. We have a crane that's being held up by two wires, which always makes me a little nervous. Um, and we have uh, about 14 other uh, folks, myself included, that are not in a very comfortable place in terms of a safe work environment. Um, that compared to the benefit of trying to transport a blunt trauma arrest, because that's really what this is. So I think we all have to keep that in the back of our mind, and I've gotten a little bit more proactive in terms of making sure that uh, particularly the extrication team is familiar that if we're dealing with a, a blunt trauma patient and, and he arrests, more often than not, we're going to stop everything right there because it's, it's not worth the risk associated with it. Um, so all of those things I think uh, you need to uh, kind of put in, put in mind. And then all the stuff that happens after the incident. And this is, this is the part that I think um, as, as EMS physicians uh, and certainly as an EMS fellow, I never really had any exposure to. But um, uh, I, will, um, I think it's important that I share this because I think it's one of those things that we don't talk about that we, that we should, um, is, is what do we do after the incident? Sorry. And you just you kind of start looking at the body language after this was called. Remember, we're still in the fishbowl, right? Everybody is watching um, all of his coworkers are watching us pull him out and yell and be really happy and excited. And then all of a sudden chaos. And then all of a sudden somebody's putting a blanket over him. 
Um, so you have almost 100 responders and, and even more folks that are all in that environment. And you look at folks' body language and everybody's just, just kind of completely, uh, completely drained, completely wiped, uh, completely, completely out of it. And really, what do we do um, after this? What do we do as an individual physician? What do we do um, for our uh, for our companies? And you know, this is uh, this is still a difficult incident for me to uh, uh, to to think about. Um, and particularly for many of our, our fire colleagues, you know, they're they're not used to being with a patient for three and a half hours and talking to him for three and a half hours. Uh, to them have him him die in front of you. And so, uh, one, we need to know uh, either uh, from, from a physician or from a, from a fire department or, or EMS agency perspective what our stress management resources are, um, allow our personnel the time they need to, to diffuse. Um, the decision by uh, the command leadership was uh, we were almost two hours past shift change. So you know what that meant, right? That meant that everybody that was on this incident were said, okay, pick up, um, grab your gear, get in the buses. You're going to get uh, taken back to station. Uh, they'll debrief you there, and we're going to get the oncoming companies to help do the pickup. And that was devastating for a lot of our firemen because they, they, they wanted to finish the job um, because at this point he still wasn't extricated. Um, he was still, he was dead, but he was stuck in there. Um, and that was really, really difficult for, uh, for the fire guys. Um, I spent uh, pretty much the entire next day um, with all of the companies involved, really just at the coffee table, uh, which as we all know, particularly in the fire service, that's, that's where everything really does happen. Uh, and it was really important um, because so many of them, I certainly understood what, what happened from a physiologic perspective, right? I mean, this guy had both significant internal bleeding that was being tamponaded by the fact that there was a crane on his pelvis. He had multiple pelvic fractures, multiple rib fractures, and then he had significant hyperkalemia um, that was uh, that was released uh, as a result of his crush syndrome. Um, so he had, um, you know, kind of both as his cause of death. But the the fire and EMS folks really didn't know that that was the case. Um, and so being able to educate them and really get them to appreciate that he was in, in many respects dead when we got there. It's just that it took three hours uh, for us to realize that became, uh, became important. And then also as physicians, I think uh, particularly as, as, as EMS docs, you know, some of us might work in, in, uh, relatively isolated uh, places, or uh, or don't have as as robust a team as as some of the uh, some of the places that I'm talking to you right now, where um, you as a responder need to talk through these things um, because it's uh, because it's it's difficult and you second guess yourself a lot and it's it's always helpful to be able to go through that. The other thing that I was completely unprepared for was this. Uh, and this is extracted directly out of um, uh, the obituary for Doug. Uh, Doug Fitzmorris was our patient, um, who was unbelievably gracious uh, to to the fire service, um, and um, they uh, reached out to me through the fire department and uh, wanted to know uh, in excruciating detail um, his last uh, three hours uh, on this earth. And uh, I had never quite been put into that position before um, to the point that uh, the fire chief and I at the family's request even went to the funeral um, and the family was unbelievably gracious uh, for everything that, that we did. But uh, really, as a physician, you kind of uh, end up taking that uh, that leadership uh, that leadership role, um, and you know one thing that I certainly regret, uh, and I know is done in, in some other systems. You know, I, I know Fidney does this a lot more than uh, for for folks getting stuck in the subway and, and whatnot. But um, you know, I certainly do regret not trying to make some sort of communication between uh, our victim and the family. Uh, the environment was probably too unsafe uh, to uh, to get uh, the wife down there or otherwise, but uh, certainly a phone uh, could have been done for a, for an incident of this of this duration. Um, and then you know be prepared to to candidly speak with the family. I think we do this certainly in the emergency department, but it's a little it's a little different 
um, when we're uh, when we're in the field. And in this case, they they wanted to know um, an awful lot. And, and certainly, um, some of us may have gone to our patients' funerals, but uh, it was a uh, it was a very surreal uh, experience. But I will tell you, it was also unbelievably healing. Um, uh, both, I think, for the family as well as for myself as an individual, um, the uh, just um, just the unbelievable outpouring of of love and support. Uh, so much of us do this job in such a thankless uh, manner <laughs> um, that to have the the support from the family was uh, was was pretty pretty unique. So, um, in, in trying to keep, uh, keep this, this short, right, um, there is a lot of learning that, that happened uh, here. Um, and so, you know, a couple of things to keep in mind. Certainly, um, be safe. Uh, um, uh, think about accountability. Think about gear sets. Think about who can access uh, your equipment uh, out, of, um, out of your vehicle. Um, certainly don't us underestimate that uh, uh, the mechanism use your use your clinical assessment uh, remember that that all of our traumas are cold and, and we really should be um, at the least passively warming them um, anticipate and aggressively manage uh, that uh, that that crush syndrome um, this had that written all over it and we missed our golden opportunity to gain vascular access, um, which in the end would not have made a difference, but I really don't care. I still would have, I certainly would have felt a lot better um, about that. Um, that is also why we did not have blood products at the scene because I didn't have any way to get it to them. Um, I mean, I thought cut downs, all sorts of different things. But as we think about the anatomy, there's not too much on the posterior side of the body that we can, uh, we can access. Um, always consider these uh, these indications, risks, and benefits of, of both field extrication uh, and and field amputation. Uh, in this case, uh, once everything kind of settled down, we got the medical examiner out there and, and so forth. Um, we did uh, perform a post mortem um, field amputation, um, uh, which again was was not uh, done uh, with any. Grace. Uh, it was done with a sawzall and a fresh blade, which is quite frankly the easiest way to do it in these environments. Um, and uh, eventually, the uh, foot was recovered when the crane was brought topside four days later, um, and then uh, and brought with uh, brought with the rest of the uh, the family, which is also a little difficult to explain to the family that not all of the body was uh, was there yet. Um, and then, lastly, really please uh, uh, take care of the family. Uh, the family meaning our, our fire and, and, and EMS family. Um, and the team that you operate with, and, and please don't forget about uh, about yourself. I think uh, we've all had difficult incidents over our careers, and and will. Um, I hope to God I never have another incident like this because it was uh, um, it was uh, it was certainly a once in a career incident, but uh, lots of stuff to learn. Uh, I hope. Um, me sharing with this, uh, sorry, me sharing this with you um, helps you think about some of these things, uh, puts them in the back of your head uh, for the next time you roll up on, on something that looks a little, uh, uh, a little odd. And, uh, and I'd be happy to take any, uh, any questions or, or conversations at this point. So all you, Christian. All right. I'm going to um, unmute everyone here, I think. Uh, <laughs> So if you have any questions from the peanut gallery, any comments? <laughs> That's Brian Clemency here in Rural Metro. Um, <laughs> yeah, who's watching the Rural Metro trainings? <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Um, I, I'm, Jim, I'm, I'm glad you shared this with us. I thought it was useful in the 20-minute version, even better for the hour version to see kind of the, the start to finish um, as a good example for EMS physicians and kind of lessons learned. Um, I'm looking at how would you passively warm him? I'm not even sure you couldn't get to him with blankets or heating pads or, or hot fans or anything to, to try, but that, that would have been frustrating. Um, we, we've had the same problem here with the trap patients, but in the, in the January, February, middle of the night times when it's freezing cold and we're having problems yep. getting to them as well. Um, and, uh, I think the only thing I would add is, uh, when we have events for my firefighters, I always caution them with alcohol. Um, I'm not sure what other folks yep. do after these types of events. 
um, when I was in the military and, and now with, with my firefighters, it's not uncommon for them to go drinking after something, something bad happens. And yep. I would just remind folks to remind their folks um, to not do that. It's common. Absolutely. It is brings people together, but it's just a, adding the alcohol to that, I think, doesn't help people learn to cope or work through what they've gone through. Um, and that's hard to overcome sometimes, but you know, adding that voice of don't do this tonight, I think it's been helpful in, the, in for my guys in the past. Um, yes. So, Absolutely. Um, Jeremy, did you do the, the postmortem amputation or did the medical examiner? Yes. Yeah. That was a, uh, that was a group effort oh. uh, between the, uh, uh, between the medical examiner and, and myself. Okay. I was thinking that must've been difficult as well. I couldn't, Seems like you, that would have been difficult to do. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, it was. It was a little. It was a little surreal, and uh, you know, certainly it's it's a little easier to do when it's not terribly messy um, and and so forth. But we had to be very. I mean, again, that was very very methodical in terms of how that was done from an investigatory perspective. Uh, you know, taking photos before and during and after and, and whatnot, uh, just to uh, just to document all of that stuff. Um, but. Um, uh, but you know, again, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating that, that all the EMS uh, physician vehicles carry a sawzall. But um, you know, it is it is one of those things to, to remember. It is uh, it is it is a resource. It's it's probably a little bit more appropriate than a no cutter. But yeah. um, um, but but still, uh, in this case, it was uh, probably the best tool for the job, given how uh, far in and under he he was. So. It's kind of a personal question, but looking back on it, would you have preferred if one of your partners came out to do that part? Would that, or did you find it more you wanted to see it through? And that was kind of yeah. Hard. No, I, I think I think I was I was fine with uh, with with doing it, uh, not necessarily having one of my other partners. I, I think you know one of the things that I mentioned earlier on is that. Um, you know, I really should have uh, made made better efforts to get another doc out there. Mm -hmm. um, for for two things, one uh, to just be able to bounce something off of folks, yeah. uh, you know, because I'm going, I'm racking my brain trying to think of um, what else could we do in terms of vascular access or whatnot. But to be able to, you know, say, hey, thank, you know, take a look at it, uh, you know, any other ideas I think would help. Um, and as I mentioned before, so often I think the MS physician ends up um, being. Uh, if you will, responsible for the health and safety of everybody else, even though that's really the safety officer's job. Um, and that was completely ignored uh, through all this. Yes, we did have water down there. Yes, but, but still, it, we probably could have done a better job um, with all of that. So having some level of redundancy, I think, is, uh, is one of those things that I, I kind of got in the zone and I, I never – yeah. Uh, I, I was I was to some extent ignorant at that point in time, and that's something that I've I've not made the same mistake uh, of since on a couple of certainly nothing to this scope, but but a couple of other incidents in, in the last few years. Fair enough. Any other questions from the group or comments? All right. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you, Christian, and uh, uh, good luck to all. Back to you. I, I would just uh, remind folks um, one thing. For next month, we may move it to Wednesday instead of Tuesday. Uh, Mike Millen from uh, oh God, uh, Johns Hopkins is going to do backboards in EMS uh, with all the changes we've been doing across the country. And he's very passionate on this topic, but he can't do Tuesday. So we may move it to Wednesday. We'll let you know. We have Mike Daly coming up in November, and we'll be looking for someone for December right before Christmas. You know, Merry Christmas. Uh, Got to make a, make a presentation, but uh, find something. Uh, otherwise, thanks so much, and uh, we will see you all back next month.